I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Director Zack Snyder's visually stunning historical epic 300 charged onto screens in 2007 and became an instant success. The reverberations of the film's hyper-stylized look and brutal ballet of violence influenced countless films that followed, and the cranked-up style has become a cornerstone of modern action cinema. The story was taken from the pages of Frank Miller's acclaimed graphic novel, and while Miller has always been Frank, about the substantial liberties he took with his version of the story, that isn't to say there's no truth to it. On the contrary, much of what the film depicts about Spartan culture is grounded in truth. So let's slash our way through 300 and find out what the fuck really happened to this movie. Set in the year 480 BC, during the second Persian invasion of Greece, 300 follows King Leonidas as he and a small army of 300 warriors defend Sparta against the approaching Persian army, led by the god King Xerxes, who wishes to absorb the Greek city-state into his ever-growing empire. Over the course of five days, Leonidas and his army face endless waves of enemies at the narrow coastal passages of Thermopylae, also known as the Hot Gates. The Spartans fight hard, but ultimately perish at the hands of the substantially larger Persian army, which ancient historians numbered at close to one million, although modern scholars consider that to be greatly exaggerated. Frank Miller crafted his now iconic story utilizing the only reliable sources of information concerning the event, which come from famed Greek writer Herodotus, considered by many to be the father of history, and later a Sicilian historian by the name of Diodorus Siculus. These accounts are brimming with stories of heroism filled with both praise and bias, so it's difficult to separate exaggerations from actuality. These tales were meant to inspire, and because historical record keeping wasn't exactly a recognized practice back then, many of the facts were most likely embellished to heighten the themes of glory and bravery. The reality of the ancient civilizations in these types of swords and sandals movies is still hotly debated among scholars, making it difficult to discern fact from fiction. That being said, there is much more information available concerning Sparta as a whole, and one of the more accurate aspects of 300 is in its depiction of Spartan life and traditions at the time. The film opens with baby Leonidas being inspected by a Spartan elder for any physical deficiencies or abnormalities. The elder stands on the precipice of a cliff with a pit of tiny skeletons beneath it. If Leonidas was found to be unfit, he'd be dropped over the ledge and left for dead. As brutal as this may seem, it's actually fairly close to the Spartan reality. While ancient scribe and historian Plutarch states that babies were discarded into a pit at the foot of the sacred Mount Tigetus, as shown in the film, many historians see this as inaccurate. In reality, the babies were often abandoned on a nearby hillside, where they would either perish from the elements or be rescued by sympathetic strangers. As we continue through Leonidas' childhood years, he's taken from his home and sent to the Agogi, which is where Spartan children were trained to become ruthless warriors. He's forced to fight for survival, taught to endure incredible pain, and is thrown into the wilderness on his own, with little clothing or weaponry. In reality, the Agogi was just as brutal as depicted in the film. If anything, it was worse. It was meant to train these boys to become merciless, cold-hearted warriors. Killing was to become second nature to them. They were forced to fight to the death, steal their food, and survive the wintry wild using only their wits and limited resources. Those who couldn't make it were left for dead. They were useless to Spartan society. The film diverges from reality in one area, however. Leonidas's rite of passage involves him hunting and killing a wolf. In actuality, Spartan boys were tasked with hunting and killing a human slave. The ritual was meant to teach evasiveness and cunning. If the boy was caught, he would be punished accordingly, which meant death. Miller most likely omitted this fact, as did Snyder and his producers, in favor of showcasing Leonidas and his fellow Spartans in a more positive light. Fast forward to King Leonidas, ruler of Sparta. Actor Gerard Butler depicts Leonidas as fair and just, but vicious when he needs to be. He's married to Queen Gorgo, played by Lena Headey, and together they rule over the Greek city-state. There is no question that these two figures were real. But Leonidas wasn't the only king. Sparta was actually a diarchy, meaning there were two kings. In this case, Leonidas' co-ruler was King Leotychidus, who was left out of the movie and graphic novel. The five ephors that we meet later in the movie also shared power with them, acting as a sort of balance when the kings disagreed or failed to cooperate with each other. Soon after our introduction, King Leonidas is approached by Persian messengers to demand land and water from the king in his city-state. In other words, submit to Persia or face certain death. What follows is the now infamous THIS IS SPARTA! Scene. 
where Leonidas kicks the Persian emissary into a seemingly bottomless pit. It's a badass scene, even if bottomless pits aren't real. Fearing the imminent destruction of his beloved home, King Leonidas pays a visit to the Ephors in order to seek permission to launch a preemptive attack against the approaching Persian army. The Ephors, who are portrayed as inbred swine, more creature than man, consult the Oracle, who decrees that Sparta cannot go to war during the time of Carnea, an annual festival held in honor of the god Apollo. Leonidas descends the mountain where the Ephors live, angered by their decision, and unaware that they were bribed by Xerxes to turn against Sparta. There's a lot to unpack in this scene, and some of it is actually based in fact. As mentioned, the Ephors were real, and were to be consulted on all political matters before either king could make a decision on it. These Ephors, however, were not inbred swine or priests to the old gods that resided in sacred mountains. They were simply elected officials who were regular, everyday Spartan citizens. However, it is true that Leonidas was forced to consult with them, and it is true that warfare was forbidden during the time of Carnea, as stated in the film. But given the danger of the situation, in real life, the Ephors actually made an exception and agreed with Leonidas, granting him permission to rally a small army of soldiers. The Ephors' betrayal of Sparta was a purely fictional creation for the film. Oracles were also an important part of Greek society and were believed to receive their word directly from the gods. As such, their words and prophecies were not taken lightly, and it is written that King Leonidas did in fact visit an oracle before going off to war. But rather than a Spartan concubine, it was the Oracle of Delphi, who is famous in Greek literature. The next day, King Leonidas assembles his 300 troops. They were indeed part of his royal bodyguard, as he tells the inquiring councilmen. But he didn't need to lie about his mission because the Ephors actually ordered him on it. And that mission, to intercept the Persian army at the hot gates, is the same as it was in real life. As the soldiers depart, Gorgo tells her husband to Come back with your shield. Or on it. According to Plutarch, this was apparently a common saying, but as a parting call of mothers to their sons, as a reminder of their duty to Sparta. It was believed that a soldier who returned without the heavy shield had abandoned it and therefore deserted combat. Dying in battle and being carried home on your shield was nearly as worthy as returning victorious. The 300 march out of Sparta and meet up with a group of Arcadian soldiers. Now it is true the Spartans fought alongside the Arcadians, but what the film overlooks is the fact that they were also joined by soldiers from 13 other Greek city-states as well, bringing the total number of warriors to upwards of 6,000. It should also be noted that Snyder's version of Spartans, composed entirely of white actors with vaguely British accents, is a far cry from reality. Positioned between present-day Turkey and Italy in the Mediterranean, ancient Greeks were more fair-skinned than their Middle Eastern counterparts, but they were not the nordified, blue-eyed versions we see in the film, as stated by Iranian historian Dr. Kave Farouk. He admits that while Scotland is a considerable distance from Greece, Gerard Butler did resemble what a typical ancient Greek might look like, based on discovered paintings from the era. Worse than that is the movie's demonizing of the Persian invaders. Xerxes, played by an actor of Brazilian and Italian descent, by the way, is portrayed as a nine-foot-tall giant. His generals are malformed and disfigured beings with rusted saws for arms, and his soldiers are inhuman and literally not of this world. While one hopes that nobody would see this movie as anything other than fantasy, it does promote a problematic central conflict in which a small group of brave white soldiers must defend their home from hordes of invading foreign monsters. Furthermore, the non-monstrous Persians are portrayed as African, Middle Eastern, and Asian. As Dr. Farouk states in his analysis of the film, there were no recorded instances of Africans being part of the Persian army. Not only that, but uncovered art pieces from ancient Greece distinguished the Persians, now present-day Iranians, as Caucasian. The decision to make them African and Middle Eastern in appearance is outright inaccurate. This also seems like a good time to address the Spartan armor, a leather speedo in a red cape. One of the most mocked aspects of the film, it deserves pointing out that Spartans, or any Greek soldier for that matter, didn't really fight practically naked. They typically wore bronze chest plates, helmets, and tunics, as many soldiers did at the time. Frank Miller made a conscious decision to strip them of their plates, saying, I took those chest plates and leather skirts off them for a reason. I wanted these guys to move and I wanted them to look good. Also, in reality, every soldier was given a plumed helmet, not just King Leonidas, as it made them appear taller and thus more intimidating to the enemy. King Leonidas and his small Spartan army thus set off towards the hot gates, passing through a small village raised by the monstrous Persians. While there's no way to verify whether or not this happened, it isn't that unlikely, as this was a fairly common practice in ancient warfare and utilized by many conquering armies, including Sparta. Soon after, King Leonidas is approached by a deformed hunchback by the name of Ephialtes. 
as a baby, his parents fled Sparta to spare him certain death. But now he wishes to redeem his father's name by fighting alongside the Spartans. He also warns of a secret passage the Persians could use to achieve the upper hand. Though sympathetic, Leonidas ultimately refuses the offer of Ephialtes, because his deformities prevent him from fighting in the phalanx, which was the Spartans' primary fighting technique. Devastated by the rejection, Ephialtes makes his way over to the Persians, where he finds King Xerxes surrounded by an orgy of deformed women and goat-headed musicians, which it seems reasonably safe to say didn't really exist in ancient Persia. Ephialtes pledges his allegiance to King Xerxes and, in exchange for wealth and power, promises to show him a secret passage that could lead to the Spartans' demise. The God King accepts the offer, which seals the Spartans' fate. Although heavily exaggerated in the film, Ephialtes was actually a real person. According to Herodotus, whose writings were the basis for most of the graphic novel, Ephialtes did in fact betray the Spartans and inform the Persians of the secret passage that led to their doom. However, where Miller and the film diverge from the truth is in Ephialtes' deformity. There are no records to indicate that he was a hunchback, or even someone who wished to fight alongside the Spartans. Rather, historians now believe him to be nothing more than a farmer or peasant who approached King Xerxes out of hope for money and lavish excess. Rejection by King Leonidas had nothing to do with it. Although elements of Ephialtes were fabricated for dramatic effect, if it were true it probably would have gone down the same way. The Spartans fought in a battle formation known as the Phalanx, in which the soldiers formed a wall of overlapping shields and layered spear points, which protruded out from the sides of the shields. This prevented any attacking forces from overwhelming them, as they would be unable to penetrate the formation. It was quintessential to the Spartan warfare playbook, and any weak links like Ephialtes would lead to its failure. We get our first glimpse at this seminal Spartan formation during the first battle sequence, where King Leonidas and his men fend off the first wave of Persian attackers. Ancient historian Diodorus Siculus notes in his writings that the Spartans were able to cut through the attacking army like ribbons, defeating hundreds of enemy soldiers while only facing a handful of casualties themselves. The accuracy of this claim is difficult to verify, but the film takes it as fact. It's important to note that Frank Miller and Zack Snyder took some excessive liberties with the battle sequences, which are the true meat and potatoes of the film. Historical accuracy is ignored in favor of fantastical flourishes and ultra-stylized violence. And while it makes for an entertaining movie, it doesn't make for a truthful one. But let's be honest, no one involved in this film set out to make a documentary. Snyder himself even refers to it as an opera. But still, underneath the heavily saturated facade, there are still some truths to be found. So what's real and what's not? The first battle sequence in the film is probably the most accurate, as it lacks the crazier elements that populate later sequences. This is just swords, shields, and spears, making for a visually invigorating fight sequence. The only detail that is perhaps exaggerated is the Spartan death toll, which Herodotus and Diodorus claim to be as low as two. Unable to defeat the Spartans, the Persians are forced to retreat. Soon after, King Xerxes calls for Leonidas' audience and offers him wealth and power beyond his wildest dreams, so long as he submits. While the supposed God King was surely an imposing presence, he was not a nine-foot-tall, hairless, bedazzled giant as depicted in the film. He was much shorter and had a beard, as did many people at the time. King Xerxes was also never on the front lines of battle, as he is shown here. King Leonidas rejects the God King's offer. In retaliation, Xerxes sends his most elite soldiers, the Immortals, to attack the Spartans. Here they're portrayed almost like ninjas, wearing Asian-inspired masks and black robes, and were rumored to be, you guessed it, immortal. While the Immortals were real, they were nothing more than Xerxes' royal warriors, much like the 300 were Leonidas's. They were not deformed creatures, they didn't wear the attire they are depicted wearing, and, believe it or not, there were no chained albino giants that were used as walking battering rams. The combat gets crazier as King Xerxes continues to send waves of reinforcements to tear down the Spartan army, utilizing war elephants and rhinos that look straight out of Middle Earth. The soldiers' regalia becomes more extravagant, especially with the arrival of the mystics from the east who fight with ancient grenades. Cool, but unfortunately none of this is true. While elephants did play a role in some ancient wars, their earliest appearance wasn't until the Battle of Gagamila in 331 BC, nearly 150 years after the Battle of Thermopylae. Mystic grenades are also a total fabrication. These soldiers were most likely slaves in the Persian Empire, not mystical warriors. While the Spartans sacrificed their lives on the battlefield, there was no shortage of politicizing behind the scenes. Back in Sparta, Queen Gorgo, Leonidas' wife and half-niece in real life, works tirelessly on behalf of her husband to convince the Spartan Council to send more troops, but she's thwarted by Councilman Theron, played by Dominic West, who has been bought out by Xerxes. He slanders the Queen in front of the Council, calling her reputation into question. 
In a fit of rage, Queen Gorgo retaliates by brutally stabbing Theron in front of everyone. As he dies, Persian gold coins fall from his pockets, revealing his true allegiance to Xerxes. As a result, the Spartan Council sides with Gorgo, and they agree to send reinforcements. While it is true that Queen Gorgo is respected among ancient historians like Herodotus for her wisdom and political judgment, her role in the film was totally fabricated. As a matter of fact, it wasn't even in Miller's graphic novel. She did not kill a traitorous councilman, also a Snyder invention, and rally support for her husband. Send our army for hope. It is worth mentioning, however, that women in ancient Sparta were granted more liberties than women in other ancient civilizations. They were educated, and although their primary duty was to bear children, their wisdom was respected. And while the real Queen Gorgo was never directly involved in political decision-making, her counsel was often sought by her husband when making those tough calls. Unfortunately for Queen Gorgo, reinforcements wouldn't save her husband and his troops. After Ephialtes informs the Persians of the secret passage that leads to the Spartans' flank, they take advantage of this information and launch a devastating assault on Leonidas and his men. Weak and heavily outnumbered, the Spartans succumb under a massive barrage of arrows that blocked out the sun, much as they likely did in real life. Before this final confrontation, however, Leonidas pulls aside Delios, the film's narrator, played by David Wenham. Blinded in one eye during battle, Delios is told to return home so that he can share their story. Delios is hesitant, but Leonidas refuses to take no for an answer. Delios obliges and returns home, the only survivor of the now-famous Battle of Thermopylae. Interestingly enough, Delios is believed to be based on a real person, Aristodemus of Sparta, who indeed left the battlefield due to an eye injury. At the end of the film, Delios recounts the inspiring tale to Greek reinforcements, who appear to number in the hundreds of thousands. The film ends with Delios acting as the head of the new Spartan army, charging into battle, determined to defeat the Persian invaders. Unfortunately, Aristodemus was not the inspiring leader that Delios became at the end of the movie. In reality, he returned home alone from the battle, and because he was the only survivor, he was labeled a coward and was shamed by Spartan society. He was ignored, left to live in filth, and was admonished by his peers. His redemption came a year later during the Battle of Plataea, where he fought with such reckless abandon and suicidal tendency that his honor was restored. So there you have it the true history of the Battle of Thermopylae. While the Spartans suffered defeat there, it was only a small chapter in the large book that was the Second Greco-Persian War. A major turning point came a year later when famed general Themistocles led a large Greek naval force to victory over the Persians at the Straits of Salamis, a monumental event covered in the 300 sequel, Rise of an Empire. At the end of the day, while the movie does feature a surprising amount of truth behind the story of Leonidas and his brave soldiers, Frank Miller and Zack Snyder's fantastical flourishes ultimately make 300 more fiction than fact.